few months ago, I was recommended a documentary video of the life and times of Prince Kabu, who would later change his name to Samuel Morris. Now, after finishing the documentary, I was truly inspired by the life God had given this young man. Now, typically, my personal favorite type of man of God has always been the warrior type, men like King David, Samson, and Joshua. But Samuel Morris was a different type of warrior. Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Samuel Morris is a literal embodiment of Proverbs 3, 5. And this is exactly what excited me about this young missionary story. He had a childlike faith that on the outside may have appeared to be immature and foolish at times, but it was exactly how we as Christians are called to be. And this is why the Lord continually blessed and answered Samuel's prayers. So the overall theme of this short series is going to be childlike faith. But in part one, we are going to be covering the great escape of Prince Kabu. Over 130 years ago in a small West African Liberian village, Prince Kabu was born to a very prominent tribal family, and they were named the Kru tribe, a very well-respected and prosperous tribe. Prince Kabu was the eldest son of the village's chief, and he was heir to the throne. And as far as we can tell, the young prince had a very decent and wealthy upbringing per the standard of tribal people of that time. But the prince's peace wouldn't last very long. The first major trial that the Lord brought into young Prince Kabu's life came when a neighboring tribe invaded their village and essentially took Kabu hostage after defeating his family in battle. Now, after taking Kabu hostage, once the enemy tribe returned to their village with Kabu, the chief of the conquering tribe subjected the young prince to whippings, beatings, and cruel labor that was meant to dishonor Kabu's father. Now, the word that comes to mind for me here is the word chastened. The word means to discipline or punish. And I believe that the Lord brought this punishment and harsh discipline into the life of Kabu to prepare him for what was to come, to humble him and to kill any pride that he may have acquired from his prominent young life. Now remember, Kabu was royalty within his tribe. Hebrews 12, 6, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Now we all understand that the Lord disciplines his children when they fall into sin. But I also believe that he uses his chastening for growth and maturity. And I believe that that was the case here for Prince Kabu. Prince Kabu has now become a prisoner. And the conquering chief sends back a message to Kabu's father that if he wants his son back alive, he will need to pay a hefty ransom. Now, it was customary for African tribes of that time to tie up their slaves and place them in the middle of the village so that everyone could keep an eye on them. The people of the tribe would mock Kabu, throw feces on him, slap him around and do everything they could to humiliate him. Now, time had passed and the chief of the tribe that took Kabu was growing more angry by the day. And because of that, Kabu's punishment became more severe. Now, me being a Christian, one thing I know about God is that he delights in emptying his elect before saving them, bringing them to their end. And when it seems like there is no hope left, that's when he rushes in and saves them. God will strip you of every hope that you could cling to so that the only thing you can do is look up and say, Lord, help me. By this time, some weeks had passed. Prince Kabu is still tied up at the center of the opposing village. And on this day, the war chief of that village had had enough. Everything that Kabu's father had tried to give the enemy village, it was never enough to have Kabu released. And so on this particular day, the enemy chief had declared to the people that Kabu will die before the sun sets. Now for me, I like to reflect on and think about what Kabu was thinking at this moment. He had just received the news that he will be put to death. It was absolutely hopeless. In his mind, he was probably thinking, I'm going to die. At this point in his life, Kabu was not a Christian yet, and so he had no hope. But even though Kabu wasn't a Christian yet, he was still a courageous young man. And on the day that he was to be put to death, Kabu's father showed up with his younger sister, and his younger sister offered to take his place. But Kabu, being the young man that he was, would have none of that. And I'm an older brother myself. I have a younger sister, and there's no way I would have traded places with my younger sister. At this point in time, Kabu was about 16 years old, so his sister was probably anywhere from 12 to 13 years of age. Kabu's father and his siblings said their goodbyes to Kabu from a distance and then returned back to their village. At this point, Kabu was preparing himself to be killed, mentally preparing himself. Some historians believe that Kabu may have begun praying while he was tied to the pole on the ground. Now, this is when things get interesting. Right as the torture is about to begin, a bright light from the heavens shone. And Kabu heard a voice that told him to run. And at that moment, the rope that was used to tie his hands together was loosed and fell to the ground. Now, this is amazing because this isn't the first time that God has done this. Who else saw a bright light from the heavens and then heard a voice? Saul, who became the great apostle Paul. 
Acts 22, 6. Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. Now Acts 22, 9 makes it clear that the men that were with Saul did indeed see the light and were very afraid, but they did not hear the voice. And so when I think back to Kabu, standing in the center of the enemy's village, when the bright light shone from heaven, I can just see everyone running to their tents while screaming because this was no ordinary light. After Kabu heard the voice telling him to flee, that's exactly what he did. Kabu got up and ran for his life. He ran all through the night and into the morning, eventually making his way to the capital city of Monrovia. Now I can just imagine how distraught and lost young Kabu must have felt at this time, in a foreign city where he knows absolutely no one, basically homeless. But God in his loving providence caused a young boy to approach Kabu while Kabu was sitting on a curb in the street. And this young boy started up a conversation with Kabu. And after a few moments of talking, the young boy told Kabu that he should visit a nearby church and speak with a woman named Miss Nalls, who was a missionary and graduate of Taylor University. And that's exactly what Kabu did. Now, this concludes part one of my series on the life of Samuel Morris. I am excited to tell this story, and I hope that you join me in part two. Your salvation will not fail because God's name, his reputation is riding upon it. He's demonstrating something through you that he has the power to save. That your salvation was his from the beginning. It is his in the middle and it will be his until the end. People say, I praise God for he never gave up on me. He never gave up on you because he never trusted you in the first place. <laughs> this has never been about you. Were you there before the foundations of the earth were laid? Were you the one who chose him? No, he chose you. Before you were born, he worked through generations with your name, knowing when he would bring you here. He let you run as far as he would allow you to run for his own glory so that when he saved you, people would speak of him. And he who began a good work in you will finish it.